What beautiful, uh, stunning words. Forever now, I'll sing your praise. Forever now, I'll say hallelujah. God, in fact, saves. He is all-powerful. And uh, that's been the testimony of my life. And many of the people here uh, who are part of our church is just the fact that Jesus is who he says he is. He can do what he says he can do. And so I'm so excited to be able to start this series that we have entitled The Way of Jesus. The Way of Jesus. And particularly going to focus on his kindness. But I just want to read to you a quote from one of my uh, heroes, a man called Charles Spurgeon, who was a a famous preacher in the 18th century. And um, this is such a great quote. Have a listen. It says, A good character is the best tombstone. A good character is the best tombstone. Those who loved you and were helped by you will remember you when forget-me-nots have withered. Carve your name on hearts, not on marble. Carve your name on hearts, not on marble. I want you to think about the people whose names are carved on your heart because of their kindness, because of their selflessness, (laughs) Because they're willing to stand for something that's right and true because of their goodness. Can you think of someone? Oh, that's good. Just checking that you're all locked in and listening. Good. Even if it's just one person, I bet you can still recall the words that they have spoken to you, how they treated you, how grateful you are for their input and the impact that they have had on your life. Well, if you imagine that person and then you think about Jesus, <laughs> who he is and the way he lived his life and the way his name is on our lips for many people here and the way he's carved his name and made his home in our hearts because of who he is, there's been so many people in this room who would be able to tell of what he's done and he's doing in our lives. Jesus was and is the ultimate example of a fruitful and God-honouring life. The kind of life that I want to live. And the way of life that he calls each of his followers to embrace. Because of his kindness, his justice, his goodness and his selflessness, he really is the ultimate example of the person that we want to be. Am I right? Because who Jesus is and the way he acts are inseparable. Who he is and how he acts, inseparable, totally consistent. The four Gospels record that he is the ultimate personification of wholeness and integrity. And the biblical view of integrity is godly character. He's the ultimate example of a faithful and obedient life. Fruitful life, honouring God and serving others. Dr. Henry Cloud and John Townsend, they're Christian psychologists and they're authors of quite a few books, including Boundaries books. And they define godly character this way. The ability to meet the demands of reality and be fruitful in the midst of them. The ability to meet the demands of reality and be fruitful or produce good fruit in the midst of them. You might think, well, what does that mean? We think about some of the realities that we live in in our world today or the realities that are happening in your life right now. (laughs) Life has a lot of realities that are not always easy to deal with. There's relational strain and breakdown. There's cultural pressures. There's our own internal feelings and realities, desires, temptations. There's problems and obstacles. And then there's inexplainable suffering that we can't always wrap our heads or our hearts around why something's happening. There's right and wrong moral realities. The realities that we face sometimes are not easy to deal with. And with Christ's help, someone who's growing in godly character can meet the demands of those realities and be fruitful in the midst of them. That's a word for some of you this morning. (laughs) What you're going through is not pleasant 
It is not nice. You didn't ask for it. But right there in the, the, the midst of that reality that you're facing, if you look to Jesus, he can help you to display godly characteristics, to have mature response to things. The way of Jesus in the midst of what you're facing right now. He can help you to grow in it. <laughs> in Psalm 1 verses 1 to 3, it says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Sometimes God won't change every aspect of the circumstance we're facing, but he'll do something within, our, within us to be able to stand and bear up under what we're facing, to show people a glimpse of who God is in the midst of what we're facing. And a person's character is known by the fruit or that he or she leaves behind in their wake. You know a boat, how a boat leaves a wake behind it as a wave that happens? <laughs> as we go through life in our relationships with others, in our communities, in our church, in our organisations, in our workplaces, in our schools, we actually leave a wake behind us and an impact on other people. The two sides of the wake we leave behind us are tasks and mission accomplishments, things that are practical things or, or things that complete the purpose that God's made us for. But also <laughs> the quality of our relationships. In other words, did I accomplish the goals or the missions that God gave me in this particular situation or this particular season. That's important. But just as important is, were people better off as a result of knowing me? Or were people collateral damage as I was pursuing my mission? The room's gone very quiet. <laughs> True integrity is to be whole or undivided, integrated, intact, complete. So Jesus' life was marked by kindness, justice, goodness, selflessness when he walked this earth. He was and is perfect in his character, whole, undivided, integrated, intact and complete. There is no darkness in him. There's no gap in his integrity. Who he is and what he says and what he does all line up and match. And we're very aware that we fall short. Who he is is expressed and lived out in what he says and does. And what he does backs up and proves it's consistent with who he says he is. That's integrity. <laughs> and so as we grow and develop and uh, keep in step with the Holy Spirit and, and have relationship with Jesus, he wants to help us to become more consistent so that the wake that's behind us is that we're adding value into people and people's lives are better off. We can't fix people. We can't try and change every single thing about them. But the interactions that we have with people, we can leave them better off. The wake that Jesus has left behind, have a think about that one. <laughs> the impact of his integrity, it's phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. The people's lives that he has made better, the people he has transformed to become more like him, the millions upon millions upon billions of people who've been impacted by his life and his example, not just that, but his death and his resurrection. He completed the goal, the mission his father gave him, <laughs> but the way he went about it was phenomenal. He didn't just march to the cross with bodies flying everywhere thinking, who cares about them? I've got a job to do. 
When you see him interacting and relating to people in the Gospels, you see someone who shows us what God is like, who is God in human form. He blessed, healed, delivered, forgave, taught with wisdom and authority, discipled his friends and did so much good in the lives of multitudes of billions of people. And probably multitudes of thousands at that time. As the, at the end of his gospel, John writes in John 21, it says, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them was written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. We just get a taste in the four gospels. They didn't even include everything. <laughs> in Acts 10, Luke writes how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Do you know, he faced serious realities. He faced the realities of humiliation, ridicule, persecution, betrayal, rejection, crucifixion and amazingly was fruitful He was God-honouring and he was serving others right there in the midst of all those harsh realities that he faced. That's our Jesus. That's the way of Jesus. How he lived when he walked this earth and the death he died on our behalf is truly phenomenal. And so today we're going to zero in and look at the kindness of the friend of sinners, the kindness of Jesus. Jesus had a reputation as the friend of sinners. We think that's an awesome title, but it wasn't meant to be an awesome title when it was said about Jesus at the time. (laughs) It wasn't a glowing report that he got. It was actually said with contempt and a lot of disgust, really. He was looked down upon and mocked by the Jewish religious leaders because he displayed undeserved kindness to people. Especially when he was kind to those that they had written off as unclean, as immoral and offensive to God because of their outward sinful behaviour. In Mark 2 verse 15, I'm going to read a couple of these passages from the gospel from the message paraphrase because sometimes when we read scripture we become familiar with it we think yeah yeah I know how this goes and we miss the strength or the lesson or the 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 intent of what Jesus is saying sometimes so it's good to grab other translations good to grab other uh, biblical paraphrases and read them through side by side and just as you're asking the Holy Spirit say speak to me Lord show me what this means Mark 2 verse 15 says, Jesus and his disciples were at home having supper with a collection of disreputable guests. Unlikely as it seems, more than a few of them have become his followers. The religion scholars and Pharisees saw him keeping this kind of company and lit into his disciples. What kind of example is this? Acting cosy with the riffraff. Jesus overhearing shot back, who needs a doctor? The healthy or the sick? I'm here inviting the sin sick, not the spiritually fit. And I reckon he said that in parentheses. (laughs) Because later in Matthew 23, Jesus reserves his strongest rebukes for this same group of people who thought they were doing God a favour by their outwardly pious observant of the Jewish law and their religious traditions. They thought they, this meant that they were spiritually fit and justified in their self-righteous disgust that Jesus could stoop so low, <laughs> wanting to be around such wicked people. But Jesus, mate, he is stunningly, honestly brutal sometimes because we need a truth encounter sometimes. He needs, he needs to remind us how it really is and what we think is just outward. He goes straight for the heart. <laughs> he exposes them as hypocrites and is 
his assessment of the reality of their spiritual condition is actually quite stinging. So have a listen to this in the message again. Matthew 27, 27 to 28. You're hopeless, you religion scholars and Pharisee. Frauds! You're like manicured grave plots, grass clipped and the flowers bright, but six feet down, it's all rotting bones and worm-eaten flesh. Poor. People look at you and think you're saints, but underneath the skin, you're total frauds. He saw through their hypocrisy. He saw through their judgmental attitude. And he sees through ours. Jesus knows in reality that we're all sin sick and in need of a doctor, a spiritual doctor, Dr. Jesus. We need him. (laughs) We need him, whether there's gross outward things that we think are offensive to God or the scripture talks about that are wrong or whether there's toxic entrenched judgmental attitudes that live in our hearts and fester away. Pride often blinds us to our need for Dr. Jesus, don't you reckon? You're allowed to be interactive. (laughs) Jesus, the healer of our souls, the only one who can restore us to right relationship with God, says, you know what? The outward... It's just a manifestation of the inward. (laughs) We need an inward transformation first. Otherwise, it can look good on the outside, but underneath it's rotten. Not pleasing to God at all. Pride often blocks us from reaching out and showing kindness to others. We think we're right. We think they don't deserve it. Sometimes, and this is really ugly thing to call out and notice, but it's true. Sometimes we think we're better than others. But Jesus shows us a better way. He shows us his way. Because he didn't come and stand afar with his arms crossed, pointing his finger going, sort yourself out. Then you can come and have a conversation with me. Get yourself together. Pull yourself up by your socks. Stop doing what you're doing and then come and talk to me. No, he came and he entered into the mess and the sin-stained lives of human beings and this world. Not to point point the accusing finger, but to help. Praise the Lord. (laughs) To establish a new way of operating. Peace with God. Forgiveness for our sins. Reconciled relationships with one another. He wants to transform the lives of people from the inside out with his kindness as we look at his life his way of doing things we have a perfect model for how we can grow in kindness and we also have God's power that's available to us a new power that's in operation because Christ has died for the sins of you and I for the whole world that he was buried but after three days we just celebrated at Easter but we celebrated every day he is risen And he's poured out his Holy Spirit as a new power in operation in our lives. But it all starts with our hearts and our willingness. His way, our way. His way, our way. And it's a daily choice. His way, our way. And so we read in Psalm 139, 23 to 24, it says this. This is a prayer. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. And that is the place we start and the place we keep coming back to. And this morning I want to pause right in the middle of this message For us to say, you know what? Here's an opportunity now for us to say, here's my heart, oh God. Search me. Know my heart. Weed out the things in my heart that are full of pride and judgmentalism and self-righteousness and weed them out. And fill me up with your kindness. Lead me in the way everlasting. So we're going to pray that and you can join in if you want right now, right across this place. Can close your eyes. This is a time with you and God.
I'm going to read these words again, but this is, this is a prayer. And as I read it, if this is your prayer, you say, that's me, God. That's my prayer right now. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's the prayer of my heart to respond to your kindness today. Amen. Amen. I'm not actually finished the message yet. But I just felt really prompted by the Holy Spirit. We need to just pause and say our hearts are willing, God. Because when our hearts are receptive and willing, that we're going to do your word even before we hear all the full implications of it. That is so powerful. God's power can flow in and through that. Jesus' kindness. Jesus sees people through God's eyes, who they are created to be. He sees fishermen who are created to be apostles and evangelists. He sees tax collectors, these greedy con artists who were created to be his friends and forces for good in the world. He sees lepers who were created to declare the praises of the God who healed them. And the good news is that when Jesus comes into our life, he changes our capacity to see too. I'm not talking about natural sight. I'm talking about he changes our capacity to see things from God's perspective, to see with spiritual eyes. No longer are we just seeing life and situations from a mere human perspective, but we have a choice whether we're going to engage this faith capacity or whether we're going to continue just to live through the lens of what we see with our natural eyes. We can choose to live not by natural sight but by faith sight. (laughs) There's a man called Malcolm Heffernan. Some of you may know him. He's one of a team of leaders in our Alice Springs Church, a beautiful Indigenous man who I want to just talk about this morning in the context of Pastor Alan Steele, I believe, saw him through God's eyes, showed him kindness. Alan responded to Jesus' prompting to see Malcolm with eyes of faith. And he sought him out in Victoria Square. He told him how he could get help when he was ready. He welcomed him with open arms when he walked along the train track to get to our church. He helped him practically and encouraged him, got him working and serving. He discipled him and walked alongside him as Jesus' power released Malcolm and restored him to what God had made him and called him to be. Now, instead of a man with a life-controlling addiction, alcohol addiction, Malcolm is a man on fire for Jesus, a wonderful leader as part of our Alice Springs team, an influencer for good, and a man with a life-giving message. If Jesus did it for me, he can do it for you. Hallelujah. What happened if Alan just saw him as he was. It seemed hopeless. But God encourages us and gives us the capacity to see people as he sees them, with faith eyes, who they can become in Christ. We need the Holy Spirit to help us do that. We can't do it in our own strength. In Luke 10, 23, Jesus says to his disciples, blessed are your eyes, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. Because prophets and kings and people who followed God all up to the time of Jesus prayed for and longed for to see the the coming king. Right there in front of their eyes, he was there. So we need to engage with our capacity to see people as God sees them. How do you do that? 
you step out. You ask God to help you and then you step out and have a go. You speak into people's life what God says about them. You encourage them. You pray for them. You go and seek them out. Most of all, you remind them how God sees them. (laughs) We can do that, church. Some of us are doing that. Some of us can do it more. Some of us can start doing it. Jesus sees people through God's eyes and Jesus is compelled to respond with kindness. There's so many accounts of this in the Gospels. There's the lady who was caught in the act of adultery, the woman bleeding for 12 years who had no other hope with doctors, the mothers and fathers of children who died that Jesus gave them back their child, raised from the dead. People being tormented by demonic demonic oppression. People of low reputation. And you see Jesus showing kindness to people. Revealing the presence and power of God. Stretching out his hand, healing. What stops us from responding with kindness? We talked about the hardening of our hearts that can happen. (laughs) But also self-interest. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be inconvenient. It's going to be annoying. And a big one is busyness. 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 It starts with this hurry that's in our heart. It blinds us to respond with kindness. In 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about Christ's love compels us. And then he goes on to say, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. No one, every person you lock eyes with, Jesus died for. Every person. I don't care if they look awesome on the outside, look like they have their life all together, or whether they look like, and you know and they know that they definitely don't have their life together. Jesus died for every person that you come across. He loves every person that you come across. You can add value to every person that you come across. The greatest kindness you can show someone is to introduce them to Jesus. How? Well, you can start by being kind to them. (laughs) Be kind to them. They will wonder why you want to be kind to them. Why would you go out of your way? Why would you pay for their meal? Why would you give up your ticket, a plane ticket, so they can go on that plane and you can catch another one because you don't have to rush in time? Why, when they compliment you on a piece of jewellery, you said, do you want it? You can have it if you want. When you notice someone, and we do notice people in need, we do notice people in situations. When you notice someone, start having a conversation with Jesus right then. What do you want me to do next? As you notice someone, as you're talking to them, you see a need, you see a person who's struggling... Okay, Lord, what do you want me to do next? It might be something really practical. It might be invite them to church. It might be invite them to your house. It might be make them a meal. God's been speaking to me about a particular neighbour and giving me a practical idea. Just the other day as I was leaving my house, I'm thinking, God, how do I connect with this person? Bam, an idea came straight into my head. He wants to give us creative ideas and strategies for how to be kind. Ask, what should I do next? And then step out and do what Jesus is asking you to do. (laughs) We can be someone's experience of the kindness of God. We can deposit kindness wherever we go. As we stay attuned to the Holy Spirit, we can respond to those promptings. Have a conversation with him this week at work. Have a conversation this week as you're talking to the mum when you drop off your kids. What do you want me to do next? Believe he'll give you an idea and do it. As you use that capacity to respond to his promptings, your awareness of it grows. We can ignore Jesus' promptings and experience the dulling of his voice in our lives or we can obey him and respond with kindness. 
Jesus also sees what people need, what, not what they deserve. We see what they deserve, not what they need. Don't we? Do you agree? We see what people deserve, not always what they need. Jesus always sees what people need, not what they deserve. That's why he tells the story of the Good Samaritan when someone's asking, what do I do to inherit life? And sprouts off this knowledge of loving God with all their heart, mind, soul and strength and loving their neighbours themselves. And Jesus says, okay, that's correct. Do it and you will live. (laughs) He knows we can't do it perfectly. We need his help, right? But then looking for a loophole, this same religious leader goes, well... What exactly do you mean by my neighbour? And so Jesus tells this story. He said there was a man travelling from Jerusalem to Jericho and on the way he was attacked by robbers. He was beaten up. They took his clothes and left him half dead lying on the road. Along the way came a priest who saw the man, it says in the text, saw the man but hightailed it to the other side of the robe. thought, Maybe he thought, I'm busy, I've got stuff to do. But he didn't help. Then a Levite came along the road and saw the man, it says again, but he wasn't moved to help. And then a Samaritan came along, one who Jewish people thought was a bit of a tryhard, not really a real Jew, not a real worshipper of God, came along. (laughs) And he saw the man and his heart went out to him. And he picked him up and he put him on his donkey and he took him to an inn and he bandaged up his wounds and he said, here, I've got to go and finish the work that I've got to do. Who knows what he had to do? He had to go. But he said, here's some money. I'll pay for it. And if it's any more, you look after him. Come back in the morning. When I come back, when I come back, whenever that was, if he needs more, I'll pay for it. And Jesus says, which one of these three became a neighbour to the man attacked by the robbers? And the religious scholar sort of goes, okay, well, that's pretty obvious. (laughs) The one who treated him kindly. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Jesus is highlighting that when we see a need in front of our eyes, we have an opportunity to show kindness and meet that need. We can't do everything, but we can do something. Regardless of whether we think the person deserves it or not, Jesus is defining who our neighbour is who we're meant to love as he loves. He says, the person who's right in front of your eyes with a, ne- with a massive need, that's your neighbour. He doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us what we desperately need, the loving kindness of a saviour, and he calls us to do the same. The priest and the Levite saw the same half-dead man on the road as the Samaritan traveller did, but they avoided him. They moved past him without being his neighbour. In that instance, in that instance, the true worshipper of God was not the one who could sprout the Bible and all the things that they knew about the Old Testament, was not the one who was so busy doing what they thought was God's work, but the man who stopped to help. The man who showed kindness. The man who took care of this guy's needs, even that cost him time and money. Maybe the priest and the Levite thought the man brought this trouble he was in on himself. Maybe they had an important meeting to attend. Only God knows. But through this story, he's showing us kindness matters. Kindness matters. It's how people get a glimpse of the kindness of God. The wake we leave behind us matters. The time we give to people, the way we're willing to be inconvenienced and interrupted to help gives them a glimpse of the God who is willing to come to earth and be incredibly inconvenienced by dying on a cruel cross for them. Jesus doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us what we desperately need. It cost him so much. It cost him everything. To walk in the way of Jesus is to be someone who values and adds value to lives of what God considers most precious, and that's people. 
and I don't do it perfectly, and you don't do it perfectly, but don't we want to grow in the way of Jesus? We need his help. If you're lacking in kindness, you need his help to grow in this fruit of the Holy Spirit. How do you do it? Acts of kindness. Start anywhere. Think up of something kind you can do for someone. Go do it. Don't tell everyone about it. Just go do it. The freedom of kindness will grow in your life. Lastly, Jesus is God's kindness in the flesh. He's actually the kindness of God. The kindness of God. If you want to know what kindness looks like, Jesus. The gospel is good news for all people. We're a church for all people. <laughs> and so the, the, most, the greatest thing we can do is introduce people to Jesus. But when we're kind to them... It disarms their resistance. Often people have an expectation of who they think God is and it's a false one. They think they have to get themselves together before God will accept them. But when they experience kindness, it disarms the resistance. I read a story of a man who was so frustrated that he couldn't catch this flight he was absolutely going ballistic at the airport. And we've all been in that situation. We have to be somewhere. And we're like, oh, how can we make this happen? <laughs> but then this older woman comes up, taps him on the shoulder and says, excuse me, would you like my ticket? I actually don't need to be anywhere that soon and I could probably catch another flight. Would you like it? And it's like a balloon went... <laughs> and he was like pretty blown away that someone would actually do that. That's the kindness of God. It disarms resistance. Like, why would you do that? In Titus 3, verses 3 to 7, it says this. I'm going to read it again in the NIV translation and then the message because we get the riches of some of the intent and the language of the scripture as we do it. Titus 3, it says, At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God appeared, that's Jesus. When the kindness and love of God, our Saviour, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we'd done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. He's poured it out. He's gone and showed the full extent of his love. He didn't hold anything back. He laid it down. He took the weight of sin, your sin and my sin, on his shoulders. He was nailed to a horrible cross. His blood was shed. He willingly chose it to face this harsh reality of the cross because he knew it was the only way that he could secure relationship with God forever for you and for me and for every person we come across. That's the kindness of God. <laughs> he didn't have to do it. He chose to do it. He didn't have to die for guilty people when he was innocent. He chose to do it. He didn't have to leave the beauty of heaven and the presence of his heavenly dad. He chose to come to earth. In Romans 4, 2, 4, it says, God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. Repentance is changing our mind from going our way to turning around and going God's way. 
When you see the love of Christ revealed in Jesus dying and rising on your behalf, when you see it, when you really grasp it, you can't help but want to turn and run that way. (laughs) It actually exposes our excuses as foolish. Why would we want to hold on to doing life our way when this great God has laid down his life to help us to live as we're meant to be. We want to run. That's what God's kindness is meant to do. To resist or reject God's kindness to us in Christ is foolish because he's shown us that he's so worthy of our trust. You'll never know a greater love than the love of Jesus who laid down his life for you. Human love will not satisfy you. Things will not satisfy you. You'll never know anything greater than the love of God that was poured out for you in Jesus. And you can have it. You can experience it. I'm reading from the message now, that Titus verse. It wasn't long ago that we ourselves were stupid and stubborn, dupes of sin. Ordered every which way by our glands, going around with a chip on our shoulder, hated and hating back. But when God, our kind and loving Saviour God, stepped in, he saved us from all that. It was all his doing. We had nothing to do with it. He gave us a good bath and we came out of it new people, washed inside and out by the Holy Spirit. Jesus Our Saviour Jesus poured out new life so generously. God's gift has restored our relationship with him and given us back our lives. And there's more to come, an eternity of life. You can count on this. You can count on this. You can count on him because of what he's done on the cross for you. You can stake your life on it. We're going to pray now, church, and I feel that there's people here today who have an opportunity to receive his kindness, to lay down your resistance, to surrender your excuses, to repent, which means I'm not going my way anymore. I'm going to go Jesus' way. This is your opportunity today to receive and respond to his kindness. Why don't we close our eyes? as we pray to him now. We thank you for your word, Lord God. We thank you for the truth of who you are, that you are the friend of sinners. It was meant as a, a slander, as a mockery, a, an insult, but it's actually a delight to our ears <laughs> because we know that we ourselves are in need of your saving grace. Right now as you're sitting in your seat, if you've never ever received and responded to Jesus. You've never said, come into my life. I want to follow you. Today is your day. He's not going to force his way in. But when we open our hearts, he rushes in. So right now, between you and God. You can pray a prayer, something like this. Jesus, I come to you. I run to you, actually. (laughs) I don't want to go my way anymore. I want to go your way. Come into my life. I receive your forgiveness. Thank you that you went so far and you did everything and paid the price for my sin on that cross. I receive you now. 
lead me in your way as I follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you're a Christian, you're a follower of Christ, you're a child of God, you've been adopted into his family, and you can learn to walk with him. Can we stand to our feet? Imagine a revolution of kindness going out from this place, right across our community, into our schools, in our families. Imagine what that looks like. Imagine what can be reaped from that for the kingdom as people's resistance is disarmed. If you want to be someone who's a depositor of kindness, can I encourage you? We're going to pray now. Would you stretch out your hand? Just just say, Lord, use me. (laughs) Here I am, Lord, use me to be a vessel for your kindness this week. Open my eyes. Give me opportunity this week to do some acts of kindness. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you see every hand that's raised, every heart that's lifted up towards heaven. Lord, I pray that you would be inspiring and empowering us as your people this week to go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus, to minister your kindness in ways and places that are seemingly undeserved, to people who wouldn't expect it, who never asked for it, who weren't looking for it. But Lord, they come across someone who's willing to reach out and demonstrate the kindness and love of God. Empower us this week. Help us by your Holy Spirit to respond to you and do what you're asking us to do, to stay attuned to your spirit, to say, Lord, what do you want me to do next? And I know that as we do that, Lord, there are going to be stories upon stories that pour in of how you intersect in people's lives, how you intervene, how you show them who you are. Lord, let there be much fruit that comes from this word today as your kindness goes out in Jesus' name.